This podcast is part of the Robots Radio Rocket Club, a program designed to help all podcasts reach their full potential. For information about joining the Robots Radio Rocket Club, check out robotsradio.net. Hey, all you heroes and champions, crows, pirates, and inquisitors. Welcome to the Dragon Age Lorecast. I'm Shelby. And I'm Austin. And we are so excited to bring you this podcast. Every episode, we'll be talking about a different topic in the Dragon Age universe. From the Maker to Lyrium to Aravels, we will cover it all. There will be spoilers. And always remember, swooping is bad. Hello, and welcome to the Dragon Age Lorecast. Uh, I'm Austin, also known as Teacup. And I'm SheCup, also known as Shelby. (laughs) I said it backwards from you. That's okay. Uh, We are here to talk about all things Dragon Age. And Shelby, are you ready to talk about Dragon Age? I am. I guess let's just dive right in. What do we got today? So we have another character deep dive. I feel like we've been doing one like every other week, but it all works itself out because we like didn't do one for four weeks in January and February. So today we're talking about Dorian. Dorian Pavis. All right, Dorian. Definitely uh, not like a, oh my gosh, everyone loves this character. Definitely a character that people tend to have strong opinions about. I mean, I've only met like one person who doesn't like Dorian, which we won't talk about that person. (laughs) But yeah, I think he's a pretty beloved character. And I also think he's a really important character, like for us as people in our world and also lore wise which we'll get into some of that later and i believe that dorian is the first dragon age companion that is male exclusive romance yeah male only Mm -hmm. yes male on male at least yes yeah that's what i mean um yeah yeah which is a big deal i mean i think dragon age has always kind of been Uh, at the forefront, um, at least somewhat, of leading in terms of um, LGBT representation in their video games. I mean, you know, Origins came out in 2009 and had two same-gender relationships. Um, And and one with Zevran could be um, two male, two men in a relationship. So that's pretty progressive um, for 2009. But yeah, so let's get to Dorian. Okay, so I'm just going to dive into the fun facts um, and his like general biography. So Dorian is a human mage. He is of the Altus class, which is one of the higher classes in Tevinter. And he is Tevinter. And after the events of Dragon Age Inquisition, he does become a magister. But in Inquisition, he is not a magister. He is from a prominent family who has membership in the magisterium, but he himself at that time is not a magister. And he says that in game and actually says it pretty strongly worded. Like, I'm not a magister. Like, (laughs) don't confuse me with Corypheus. Um, So he's also a companion in Inquisition, which any fan of Inquisition knows. And he also appears in the comics Mage Killer and Deception as well as to venture knights. So like we've previously talked about, Dorian is the first male companion who is an exclusive romance option for a male protagonist in Dragon Age. And promotional material for Inquisition described him as the Redeemer, which at first I was like, I don't think that fits him. And then when I thought about it in terms of like, him redeeming his homeland, his home country. I was like, yes, yeah, absolutely. This totally fits him. Dorian definitely fits that apologist role. Like someone who comes like in like apologetics, which is like a defense of something. He definitely like does that practice for Tevinter of explaining things, especially. And that's something we don't really get until we meet Dorian. Yeah, absolutely. And he also is very much a reformer. Like he wants to venture to change. He wants, you know, the country to improve and become a place that's, you know, not so hateful to elves and not so mired in slavery. And like he, he wants it to be a place 
um, that's better than what it is now. And I think most of us can relate to that. Um, there's no country in the world that, that is perfect. There's no country in the world, I believe, that's even good. And so we all have, have things, I'm sure, that we want our countries and our nations to improve upon. So I think we can all relate to him in that way. Um, but here's a true fun fact. So the Pavas family and the Trevelyan family are distantly related, even though a uh, human male inquisitor can still romance Dorian. (laughs) I mean, it happens in real life. Yeah, it does. I mean, it's not that weird. It's distant. It's not like they're not first cousins. They're not second cousins. They're not third cousins. Like it is distant. And then final fun fact, if the Inquisitor doesn't romance Dorian or Iron Bull, then Dorian and Iron Bull can start a relationship with one another. And this relationship can continue through the Exalted Council and even beyond that when Dorian returns to to Venter. And it does kind of depend on um, your choices with Iron Bull, but their relationship can continue that is my canon thing that happens is dory bull yeah it's fun i think it's a fun role reversal and i would love to like witness the conversations like that he has when he tells people that he's in a relationship with a kunari (laughs) like (laughs) uh, it's just funny and like it shows like like dorian's growth in that to enter a relationship in the kunari i think reflects who he is in that he's been ostracized for his sexuality by his family and seen as like unworthy or strange and other into venture and so he has this longing to be seen as a person and be acknowledged for his personhood and so he extends that to other people yeah that's a really good point and i definitely agree Okay, well, are we ready to get into his general biography? I am. Okay, so Dorian was born in 911 Dragon, and he was born into the prestigious House Pavis, and they lived in Quirinus, also known as Ventus. It's kind of confusing. In Codex and in comics, they refer to the city as two different names. It's, I, don't, I don't remember the exact details of why, because I haven't done research on it yet. Um, um, but it, it's referred to as both, so it can be a little confusing. Um, but this city is in the northeastern coastal area of Tevinter. And Dorian's parents are Hallward Pavis, who we meet in Inquisition, if you do his side quest. And his mother is Aquinia Thaurasian. Okay, so Dorian as a child was like super magically talented. And um, from a young age too, which doesn't always happen, but um, he was he was like very magically gifted. And this caused other children to be very jealous of him. And so he went to a circle at the age of nine. And circles are different in Tevinter. Remember, they're more like boarding schools. But again, he ran into some conflicts in the circle with some of the other mage apprentices. He ended up getting into a duel with another magister's son. As you can imagine, this would cause some major conflicts. And he left the other child very badly injured. And so he was pretty much expelled from that circle for that behavior. So after this, he pretty much hops from circle to circle to circle throughout Tevinter. He never stays in one place for too long. He doesn't make a lot of friends. He doesn't have deep relationships. He doesn't have a mentor. And so he's just kind of moving from school to school to school. And he's very much seen as like the troubled kid. Eventually, Hallward sent him to Minrathus, which is the capital of Tevinter, to attend a small school that was run by the Order of Argent. This school was known to be extremely expensive and very strict in Androstian discipline. Dorian, after three months of being at the school, disappeared, and he was found by Magister Garion Alexius in a drunken stupor in Minrathus, in a brothel in the Elven sector. Alexius gives Dorian a ride back home. 
um, but was so impressed by the conversation that they had on the way back that Alexius essentially took Dorian as his apprentice. And this is where Dorian begins to thrive. This is, this is the first time he really has a mentor that cares about him deeply. So Dorian stays as Alexius's apprentice for four years, at which point he finally became a fully fledged enchanter in the Minrathis circle. During this time, Hallward was not particularly uh, supportive fully, which is ironic to me because it's like, okay, he's finally doing everything that you wanted him to, but I digress. Hallward becomes more and more insistent that Dorian returns home and gets married. And that's, that's what Hallward wants Dorian to do is get married, come home, be the good to venture child that he's supposed to be, right? Well, Dorian puts this off by claiming that achieving the rank of senior enchanter was more important than getting married and coming home, which arguably, you know what, I totally understand where you're coming from, Dorian. So this is the beginning, probably not the beginning, but this is the beginning of the major conflict that we see between Dorian and his dad. And it doesn't get any better. No, it does not. So in 935 Dragon, Livia Arita, who was Alexius's wife, was killed by Darkspawn. And Felix, his son, was with her. And he was infected with the Darkspawn taint. We meet Felix and we meet Alexius in Dragon Age Inquisition. Alexius is the main big bad of the mage quest, siding with the mages. And he's the one that's um, creating the time magic. And he's doing all of it to basically uh, find a cure for his son um, to cure him of the Darkspawn taint, which happens here in this story. So we meet both of them um, in Inquisition, but this is an interesting backstory for them. Dorian spent two years trying to help Alexius find a cure for Felix, and um, they're, they don't get anywhere. After a heated argument in 937 Dragon, Dorian left Alexius's estate and went back to a life of debauchery, um, engaging to such excess that the scandal of, you know, what he was doing led his family to abduct him from the home of a person named Lord Ulio Abrexis. Um, and, and Dorian was in the company of Lord Ulio's son and Hallward and uh, his, his, his house basically took Dorian out of there, I would imagine, against his will. I have thoughts about Magister Alexius but we could finish, keep going. But I do have things I want to say about him. Okay, let me get through like two more points and then um, we can we can talk about Alexia so we can talk about Hallward because I have thoughts about Hall. So after Dorian gets uh, taken out of the home of Lord Ulio, he was brought back to Corinus slash Ventus by force, which is his hometown. And he's essentially kept as a prisoner. He eventually escaped into the countryside penniless, no money, and he vowed that he would never return. For two years, Dorian drifts around, up until the events of Dragon Age Inquisition, which is when he joins the party. So Dorian has spent the past two years before he comes to the Inquisition, just wandering around, doing what he can to survive. He joins the Inquisition because he wants to reform Tevinter not, and show that not every Tevinter is a slave of Corypheus. That's his end goal in joining the Inquisition. And I think he stays for that reason, but also for deeper reasons that, you know, he finds that this fight is actually worth fighting for and he finds people that he loves and, you know, all these things. And then lastly, um, I wanted to say that Dorian would have had a really promising career in Tevinter if he had like kept his head down and done what Hallward wanted him to, you know, go back home and marry the girl and have uh, mage babies and, and like live that life. Dorian would have been very successful. He would have had a very successful career. He, he maybe even could have become the Archon, you know, um, 
but instead he lives a different life. He lives a life of authenticity and he even chooses to um, call out his homeland and call for reform and improvement, which it, which makes him a pariah basically. Um, and he gets ostracized and Dorian bears this ostracism with pride, I think, um, because he very much feels that Tevinter will only change if people like him make a difference and stand up for what they really believe in. Mm-hmm. And I think you see that in Dorian's character, like even from the get go. Yeah. And I think that's not to say that Dorian's perfect or that he has everything figured out because he definitely doesn't, but you definitely, you definitely see that in him throughout the game. So I have thoughts about Magister Alexius. All right, let's hear him. So I think Magister Alexius is a really unique character for Dragon Age, especially in relation to Dorian, because if we look at the other mentor-like figures in character backgrounds. They're not good people. Marjolaine is terrible and abusive. Sarah's adoptive mother is manipulative and makes her feel terrible for her race. Alexius, to me, is a case of a character who really wants to do something good and to help someone, but is going about it the entirely wrong way. And I think that Alexius is just a mu- is just as much of a victim of Corypheus's manipulation more than anything. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. Um, and I think it highlights a really important conversation about how, like, even even though in real life too, not just in video games, like we can be victims, but we're also responsible for our own actions. Like we can be oppressed, we can be victimized by other people, but we can also do things that hurt other people. And that's exactly what Alexius does. Like, yes, he is victimized. Yes, he is just trying to help his son. And at the same time, he also hurts a lot of people and does a lot of damage um, in Red Cliff to the inquisition so he's not blameless and i don't think you're saying that at all but you're right that he is a very unique character and um i've been sitting here trying to think of like okay are there any good mentors in dragon age i think there are but you're right that they are definitely few and far between i mean duncan is not a wholly good character flemeth is is not good uh, to Morrigan. Eamon is not good to Alistair. Um, I don't know if we know about like Stan. Obviously, Zevran's life with the crows is is not good either. Isabella lived a life of crime. So, I, and I know there are more, but you're right that it he is a very interesting character in terms of the mentor mentee relationship. Cassandra. Cassandra has a positive mentor, I think, is the one yes. that I think. Um, in um, Lord Byron, I think is his name. Yeah, and I mean, even divine, the divine, divine Beatrice, I think is her name. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And Justinia to, yeah. uh, or Mother Dorothea, as she is there to Liliana. Yeah, I would say I would say Mother Dorothea is a good mentor for Liliana, but Divine Justinia is not. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's really interesting to think about. We always make jokes about like, oh, these characters are so chaotic and. Um, they like are chaotic bisexuals, especially in, in DA2 and all of these kind of jokes, but most of them, a lot of them have really never had someone like care for them and truly be selflessly caring for them. You know what I mean? Like, so of course they would be chaotic. Of course they would not know how to be like a human, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, but my point was, I just think that it's interesting that Dorian, who you think comes from Deventer, who would be probably the most likely to have the problematic mentor who's manipulative and abusive, instead has someone who fostered his talent and who, like, even till the end, Dorian says, you know, he's a good man who is just yeah. desperate. Yeah, but, you know, Dorian also has a terrible family. And this is my soapbox. Like, I already hated Hallward. I already hated him for the blood magic and conversion therapy that he puts on Dorian. I already hated him for that. And then doing this research, like, he couldn't even do one thing. Like, 
you couldn't even do one thing right for your child. Like you ship them from circle to circle to circle, right? And then you send them to the most aggressive, most disciplinarian, most authoritarian circle that exists to punish him and to basically beat him into submission. And then he escapes and you capture him. And then you do that again, basically. And it's just like, where is the love for your child? You know, and it makes me really, it makes me really mad. And I think there are a lot of bad parents in Dragon Age, Flemeth as well up there with Hallward. But I really think Hallward takes the cake. He's terrible. I hate him. Yeah. And it's just like a thing uh, for Hallward. It's, it's always about the legacy. It's always about perception. It's always about his own power and his family's name in Tementor and in the Magisterium. And there are other problematic parents, but not like that. Not where there's so much disregard for your child. Yeah, I think Flemeth is the closest example that we have. And even she, I do believe, cares about Morrigan. She is abusive and she is not a good parent, but I do think that deep down... She does care about Morgan in her own way. And I, and you know, I do think Hallward does too, but I think that he is so concerned. He is so concerned with his legacy and with like keeping up appearances that Dorian doesn't ever know that he really cares about him. And if you're interested in just heartbreak and having your heart ripped out right in front of you, take Dorian and Cole together in a party because Cole the banter that happens is basically Cole says to him, he's like, you said I could ask you any questions. And Dorian is like very hesitantly like, I did. He's basically like, so about your father. And they all get into it. And Dorian eventually just says, you know, Cole, sometimes love isn't enough. Cole is just like, enough what? Which in his way of not understanding. And it's just a heartbreaking thing of like Dorian acknowledging the fact that he loves his father, but sometimes love isn't enough. And like Cole very much pushes him on like, how can you love him and be angry with him? And Dorian's basically like, it's very complicated. Because how do you, how do you describe that phenomenon to someone who's never experienced it? You, it's very difficult. I don't think you can. Exactly. And like, that's, it's such a deep like lore moment because, you know, Cole is a spirit and at least lore wise spirits crave to experience what it's like to be like mortal basically. Mm -hmm. And so here he is asking Dorian about these deep complex and hurtful (laughs) emotions. And you just sit there and listen to it, you know, while you're being attacked by everything that exists in the hissing waste and as you're just, you know, you're crying because it just breaks your heart. Yeah, it is heartbreaking. And I think Dorian's backstory is supremely heartbreaking because he is, he's so good. Like he is so pure hearted and he has remained that way. Like through this childhood that he had, through this adolescence, through this young adulthood, he somehow managed to escape all of those horrible things and he still managed to be the person that he is like he could so easily just be a Taventer jackass and he's not um and honestly I think that is miraculous but his story is very heartbreaking and I think you see that and I think this is one of the reasons that there is a kind of bridge point for Sarah and Dorian to come to a terms of understanding because Dorian, if you ever as inquisitor do something that steps on or tramples someone who is like beneath your power, or you're using your power to oppress someone you hold power over immediate disapproval from Dorian. Yes. Yes. Even if he's not there sometimes. Mm-hmm. And I just think that like that's that's probably a bridge point for him and Sarah is that he cares about the little people too. So Sarah calls him a good noble, I guess, if there can be such a thing. Does she do that in game or are you just saying that? That's my headcanon. She might oh. do that in good name, but <laughs> I highly doubt it actually. Yeah. 
Okay, well, are you ready to move on to significant quotes and contributions? I am. All right. So Dorian is sent with the Chargers pretty often. And along with Cram, of course, and Tessa for Scythia and Marius, and they clear out the remaining Venatori, which is on brand. That definitely would be Dorian's job. Um, after Corypheus's defeat, Dorian becomes the official Tevinter ambassador to the Inquisition, which if you play Trespasser, you'll know about. Also during Trespasser, we learn that Hallward is dead and we can assume that he's been assassinated and Dorian is basically set to inherit his seat in the Magisterium. Varric and several of the companions toast farewell. Um, and this is a big deal for him because he's basically, you know, it's number one, your father's legacy, your family's legacy, and like all of that, um, those conversations about duty, of course, but also like he's, he's signing up to go back to Deventer permanently. Um, when he's made all these relationships and these connections with the Inquisition and even a relationship. And he's also signing up for the possibility of assassination, especially knowing how outspoken he's been against Deventer. Like, that is a very real possibility for Dorian. Or being allied with the Inquisition, which, you know, depending on the Inquisitor's choices, could be a very anti Deventer organization. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and then as Magister Dorian, he and Magister Mavaris Talani, who we've talked about before, and we love her and want her to be a companion in DA4. So um, Magister Dorian and Magister Mavaris found a group called the Lucerne. And this is a group that is dedicated to restoring and redeeming to Venter. It is a political group. And um, they do have, a, you know, a significant amount of power because as far as we know, they haven't been assassinated. You can see some of their actions in Tevinter Nights. Um, but Dorian is often spoken of as a voice of resistance against corruption. So not just, you know, pushing back against slavery and all these other things, but also talking about corruption. And I think that corruption really does lie at the heart of um, the root of Tevinter's problems, at least in the modern day. Okay, so I also brought two quotes. I Are love you quotes. Yeah. Are you ready for the first one? You betcha. So I think this one really sums up Dorian's character and like his motivations. And he says, if I truly believed my homeland was beyond all hope, I wouldn't miss it so much. I relate to that. Me too. I was about to be like, as a Southerner, I can relate like that tracks majorly. <laughs> and then the second quote is not everything from Tevinter is terrible. Some of us have fought for eons against this sort of madness. It is my duty to stand with you again. That is relatable. Yeah, I think so. And I think that it's just a Dorian very much views himself to stand as the anomaly, whether that's being, you know, standing for the right for his, you know, sexuality to be acknowledged and accepted into Venter or to the outside to be like that to Venter has the potential to be a force of good, to be something more than the world sees it as. Yeah, absolutely. So, where is Dorian now? Well, if Dorian is friends or in a romance with the Inquisitor, they communicate via ascending crystal. And if Dorian is romanced, um, there is the implication that they are married, not confirmed, but the implication that they are married and that the Inquisitor is into Venter with Dorian. If Dorian is romanced by Bull, like I said earlier, they also are together depending on your choices with Bull. And then finally, Dorian appears in two chapters of Tevinter Nights. He appears in Luck in the Gardens and Half Up Front. And that's where he's at now. I think he could definitely come back in DA4. I would love to see him as um, like a kind of advisor role. I think that would be fun. Or even just like a quest giver, like cameo, kind of like how Morrigan was just yeah. like briefly in a point. Um, that would be awesome. Yes, because I don't, I don't necessarily think he could come back 
as a companion, if he is like a magister and, you know, running this whole side organization of l- the Lucerne and all that, I don't think he would have time. I think he might want to, but I don't, <laughs> right. I th- I don't think his sense of duty would let him. Yes, I agree with that. Okay. So as we always end every character deep dive, why do you love or hate this character? Austin, you want to go first? I will gladly go first. So for me, Dorian is a man of his own terms. And I think that's what makes him as like a compelling character is that he does things on his own terms. He leaves for the Inquisition because he believes that it's the right thing to do. He goes back to Deventer to be an ambassador because he believes that's the right thing to do. And when he finally does become a magister, he goes because he feels like it's his duty to, and to make things right, not because he needs to fulfill his father's legacy. He takes his role as a magister as something that he's going to own, not something that's thrust upon him. Yeah, absolutely. He, he does. And I love Dorian. He is one of my favorite characters. He, um, I think he's probably my second favorite Dragon Age Inquisition companion, obviously behind Cassandra. Y'all know how I feel about her. But I do, I do love him. And I think that he was a desperately needed addition to the lore because we've never seen, we've never seen a sympathetic Tevinter. We've never seen Tevinter through the eyes of someone who loves it. We've only seen Tevinter through the eyes of people who are afraid of it or through the eyes of people who are using it, who are, who are slavers or, you know, otherwise criminals. Um, so I think that a positive view of Tevinter was definitely needed. And don't mishear me. I'm not saying that Tevinter is positive. I'm just saying that Dorian gives us a different perspective that is desperately needed. And I appreciate that. And I enjoyed it a lot in Inquisition. I also think that Dorian's story is tragic. We talked about this a little bit last week with Krim about how Dragon Age does a fairly good job of uh, not always dwelling in like the sad and tragic part of a person's life. But I, I don't know if that applies to Dorian. That would be my criticism if I had one. Because Dorian's life is really sad. The first person he cares about became a blood mage, you know, um, and sold his soul to Corypheus. And then the second person he cared about, Alexius' son, dies. And those are like the only two people throughout his life up until he joins the Inquisition that really care about him. And that's just, that's heartbreaking to me. No one deserves that. Everyone deserves to be loved and have someone that cares about them. So I wish that I wish that Dorian had more um, more people that that loved him truly for who he was. But you know, hopefully, thankfully, he has that now, and he's not a real person in real life. So whatever. But those are my thoughts about Dorian. I think another thing that attracts me to like Dorian and him as a character is that he's a character who can learn and grow, um, which is not always true of Dragon Age companions. And so I think that that's a good point about Dorian. I think that, you know, some of the criticism of Dorian is that he is kind of pro Tevinter and he does have some moments of like excusing slavery and blood magic to an extent. Um, but those are all points that he can grow and adapt for. And, and we can see that a little bit in game and that he never looks down on the elven companion Solus, or he doesn't look down on Solus because he's an elf. And he definitely looks down on Solus's fashion sense. Yes. Or lack well, of I think the only one who has an acceptable fashion sense for him would be Vivian. Because um, let's be and honest, Cullen. her fat And Cullen. Yes, but Vivian's fashion sense is fire. Um, but I think that's a really good point. And I think that like that kind of criticism, I kind of see Dorian in kind of a kinship with Miranda Lawson from Mass Effect in that. That's interesting. That's interesting. Say more. 
because you can take both characters at their surface level and where they present themselves and write them off as like, oh, well, Dorian is just, you know, it's a venture sympathizer and he's just there and he loves blood magic and he's pro-slavery. Okay, I'm just going to write him off. And you can do the same to Miranda. Oh, she's just a Cerberus uh apologist you know she's there for the male gaze and sex appeal but both characters have so much trauma at the hands of manipulative fathers and both characters seek to take their life into their own hands for a sense of control go ahead keep going keep going and they take their control through what could be seen as problematic sources that they but in a way, like Dorian's, Dorian's allegiance to Deventer offers him a freedom in a way, the same way that Miranda's contributions to Cerberus offers her a freedom and escape from her father. That is such a good point. And when you first said that, I was like, you're crazy. What are you talking about? And I've literally been sitting here listening to you like, yes, that is galaxy brain level analysis. Like you are 100% correct. Like, and I have never thought about it that way, mainly because I don't like Miranda and I've never given her the time of day to be fair. Um, But yeah, that's, that's a great point. And I'm really glad you brought it up. So that's really Dorian. Um, I think that he is a great character. And if you haven't engaged in conversations with him, like I haven't done his romance. So that's on my list of things to do. But if you haven't, at least engaged in conversations or done his quest or just talk to him about things, I highly recommend it. You'll get some great lore about the Imperial Chantry and Taventer and you'll just, and sometimes he's just funny. Yeah, he is hilarious. And I think we skipped over this a little bit. I think the big critique that I have of Dorian is that he is, he is somewhat, um, he, he doesn't take to venture slavery as seriously as he should in Inquisition, which is frustrating. But also when you think about it, he's probably never seen the real effects of slavery. Like he's probably never seen what it's really like. So I'm sure he thinks, oh yeah, there's bad slave owners and there's good slave owners, which we have the benefit of knowing that's not true. There is no good slave owner. There's, there's no good you know, person who owns other people. But for Dorian, he he probably doesn't have that perspective because why would he have ever seen the harmful realities of it? He's a privileged child from Taventer. He didn't run a household. You know, his father was still alive up through the end of Inquisition. So, um, but I think throughout Inquisition, he learns that he was wrong and that that's not true. Um, and then in Taventer Nights, he, you know, obviously has changed his mind um, and really rethought some of his previous views on slavery. So I think that's partly to do with the elves that he does encounter in the Inquisition. And, you know, he goes on missions with the Chargers. And so I'm sure he talks to Dalish. I'm sure he obviously talks to Sarah and Solus and uh, your elven inquisitor, if you are an elf. Also, the scandal that would be in Minrathis if Dorian returns with an elven man as his husband. Okay, okay. Do you think it's more scandalous if he ha- is in a relationship with a male Kunari inquisitor or a male elven inquisitor? I think I'm gonna have to go with the Kunari because I'm sure that he would not be the first person first magister to enter into some type of relationship with an elf well well okay probably one like that like okay. his okay but enter into a relationship no enter into a marriage yes like there's a big difference between those two things you know right but i think that like the elf would just be kind of like scandalous and like would be something that like the other magisters at court basically like used to like make fun of him and like degrade him in whatever way if he's married to a kunari his enemies are going to use that as a uh grounds for treason that's probably fair yeah it and honestly that's probably why the lore says it's an implied marriage and not like a lore confirmed Though, if he's with the Iron Bull, 
I will I would pay to watch magisters make a comment with bull around. They would never. They would never. Well, um, do you have anything else about Dorian? No, I think I've said really all I can say about Dorian. Yeah, I think I have too. Um, Safe to say we love Dorian. Yes, we do love Dorian. So before we go, we just want to remind you that we do have some changes to our Patreon. Um, We now have a little change to our tiers. Tier three. Now, if you subscribe to tier three, you can come on the show once a month to talk about a topic that will be voted on in our Discord. Um, So if you join to the tier three patron tier, uh, you can come on to the show and we'll have a patron chat. Uh, You can find the patron link, the Patreon link in the episode description. Also, if you want to come hang out on our Discord, uh, the Cups podcasting and more, that link is also in the description. We have a lot of fun there talking. And with the talk of our patrons, I think it's time to read our patrons for the episode. So Shelby, you want to go ahead and do that? Yes, I would love to. So our five patrons right now are Lisa M, Genesis, Derek B, Fletcher M, and Zuba. Thank you all so much for being our patrons. We're thankful for you. Yes, thank you so much. And if you would like to support us but can't necessarily support us financially, that is totally okay. Um, You can go into Spotify or Apple and leave us a five-star review. If you leave us a five-star review on Apple with some words, we will read it out on a future episode of the show. And yeah, you don't have to have an account uh, or you need to have an account. You don't have to listen on Apple or Spotify. As long as you have an account, you can go in and give us a rating or a review on Apple. It will say that you do have to like listen to like a minute of an episode before Spotify will let you rate something. Um, but you can still go in there and it really helps the show. Uh, another way to help is just tell people about us. Tell your friends if you have a friend who loves Dragon Age. All right. Well, thank you for listening. We'll see you next week on the Dragon Age Lorecast. Mm-hmm. Thanks for listening to the Dragon Age Lorecast. As always, you can find us on Twitter at DA Lorecast. If you have any lore questions, topics to unpack, or side character suggestions, email them to us at dalorecast at gmail.com. The Dragon Age Lorecast is a part of the Robots Radio Rocket Club. You can join the Robots Radio Network Discord by clicking the link in our episode description. If you enjoyed our show, we'd love it if you'd subscribe and give us a review. See you next time. Hi, I'm Aaron. And I'm Ariel. And we're the hosts of the Legend of Zelda Lorecast, a podcast about all things Legend of Zelda, from Errol to Zora. And all the fun things in between. If you're ready to dive deep and learn more about the Legend of Zelda lore and everything surrounding it, come join us on the Legend of Zelda Lorecast. You can find us on Apple iTunes, Spotify, Google, and wherever else you get your podcasts. We hope to see you soon.